Well, good evening, friends, and welcome to Pro-Life Primetime. Pro-Life leader Frank Pavone here, National Director of Priests for Life. Great to have you with us. We are live. We are live right now on the last night of May. It is, oh, Mon it is uh, what is today? When Wednesday, uh, the 31st of May. And uh, we want to uh, join you here tonight. I'm grateful for your presence, for your prayers, for your comments, and uh, uh, for your collaboration above all in this great cause of defending the unborn. We want to talk about the first anniversary of the Dobbs decision coming up very, very soon, June the 24th. It will be a Saturday, and uh, this is the decision, of course, that reversed Roe versus Wade. SupremeCourtVictory.com is the website where you can get some of the very best summaries of what this decision means, what it said, why it said it, and how we build on this victory. So I want to start as usual with my uh, devotional pro-life reflections for every day. And let's go to Luke 14. In verses 13 and 14, we read Jesus saying this, When you hold a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind. Then indeed you will be blessed because they have no way to repay you. Reflection. Jesus calls us to the purest form of love, that is, love of those who cannot repay us. The unborn children whose lives we seek to protect cannot repay us and do not even know that we are fighting for them. Pro-life work is motivated by pure love. Let us pray. Lord, increase my love for the children in the womb who cannot acknowledge or repay me. May you be my only reward. Amen. Well, friends, you know, you can obtain this book at ProLifeReflectionsForEveryDay.com. It has a scripture quote, reflection, and prayer just like that for all 365 days of the year. Okay, you remember where you were on June the 24th of 2022, the moment at 1010 in the morning when the Supreme Court announced the Dobbs decision. Now, we have been in this movement working and praying, sacrificing and marching, educating and voting for 50 years to get the court to reverse what was the single most destructive and mistaken and unjust and discriminatory decision that it ever made. It's made some big mistakes along the way, justifying segregation and slavery to a certain extent and so on and so forth. But, but it, it, nothing approaches Roe v. Wade in terms of the destructiveness. And also, by the way, the dozens of decisions that built on Roe v. Wade. There were many, many Supreme Court decisions dealing with abortion. Roe v. Wade was simply the first one to legalize it, and then many, many followed some of them better than others, but ultimately many, many destructive decisions on this topic. Well, the Dobbs decision was the fulfillment of the prayers and the sacrifices, the hopes and the dreams and the efforts of the people of God for those 50 years. I was involved in fighting it for many of those 50 years. I got involved in the pro-life movement just three years after the Roe v. Wade decision came down. Three years. So it was 1976. I was a high school senior. And uh, many of you are uh, uh, likewise uh, in this movement for a long time and have been. Michael is pointing out it's the solemnity of the birth, the nativity of St. John the Baptist on the 24th of June. And of course, that was very much in our minds and hearts last year as this uh, decision came down. And uh, because of the way that the liturgical a year works. It was also last year, will not be the case every year, the Feast of the Sacred Heart of, uh, of Jesus. So we really had um, liturgically God kind of uh, uh, winking his eye at us. And, and now every year when we have the, uh, the anniversary, we'll be able to reflect on that. Here's John the Baptist in the womb of his mother, uh, Elizabeth, and he leaps for joy as an unborn baby when Jesus, also in the womb of his mother, Mary, is in his presence there at the visitation, which, by the way, 
is today. Today's the feast of the, of the visitation. So today's the day when that, these one unborn child is, 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 is greeting uh, the other and uh, how meaningful it is. Not only that story about uh, John as an unborn baby and of course a, fe a liturgical feast day where we are celebrating a birth. John Paul II says in the Gospel of Life right at the beginning that the, the joy of Christmas, the birth of Christ, should uh, echo the, the, the joy of, uh, 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 rather the birth of every child should echo that joy that we celebrate at the birth of the, of the Savior. Well, likewise the birth of John the Baptist who introduced the world to Christ. Furthermore, we also have, besides the, the theme of the joy at the birth, we've got the theme of the fearless preacher of truth to power. John the Baptist, he f preached truth to power in defense of marriage. It is not wrong for you, it, it is not right for you, Herod, to have your brother's wife. And, and he ended up having his, his head chopped off, but he didn't waver. He, <coughs> he didn't waver from proclaiming the truth. So when we're dealing with something like abortion, what an, what a, what a, what a, uh, an appropriate liturgical day this happens. So SupremeCourtVictory.com, one of your best sources. <clears throat> That's our website talking about this Dobbs case. You can find the documentation for it. You can find interviews and presentations I did over the course of the time uh, that um, the case was percolating. You can find all the briefs. You can find a detailed explanation of the decision itself, section by section, you'll find a lot there. So as we approach the anniversary, here's what I recommend. We have a little less than a month to go. Revisit the decision. Reread the decision. And if you haven't read it once already, read it. Again, it's right there, SupremeCourtVictory.com. By the way, we got this domain well before we knew that it was going to be a victory. SupremeCourtVictory.com, we, we, uh, we had that right from the beginning. Read it. Watch some of the videos that are on this site. Learn more about what this decision says and what it means. Because only when we learn more about it can we build on it. And that's the first point I want to make. I want to give you five things tonight to keep in mind as we approach this first anniversary of Dobbs. And here is point number one. We have to learn what Dobbs means. We have not yet adequately absorbed the meaning of this decision. You know, when people ask me, well, what, does the first, what is the first thing the pro-life movement has to do after the Roe v. Wade has been reversed? And I say, well, the first thing we have to do is to understand Dobbs. For 50 years, the court system, our lawmaking bodies, and both of these at both at the federal and state levels, the media, academia, public discourse and private conversation have all been shaped by the holdings of Roe versus Wade. And then 20 years later, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which then lasted for another 30 years. That's a lot of time and that's a lot of uh, mental framework to adjust now when that has all gone off the scene, Roe and Casey. All the court decisions that were based on those, I said, I said a little while ago, there have been dozens of court decisions on abortion after Roe. They were all applying Roe. I mean, in many ways, they, they weakened Roe, but they all applied its central holding. And many, many, many more, hundreds and hundreds of lower court decisions that whether the judges who decided those cases liked it or not, many of them criticized Roe, but they had to apply it as precedent. So you've got a, this, this decision, Roe v. Wade, I'm talking about, and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, 
has its tentacles and has had its tentacles go very deep into American law and jurisprudence and, and just everyday thinking and conversation and writing about abortion. So if you think in just one year, you know, we have totally erased that, gotten that out of our system and understood the new precedent now, because remember, it's not just looking past, looking backwards that it reversed Roe and Casey, but looking forward, Dobbs is now precedent for other cases, both of the Supreme Court, that's called horizontal precedent, and of the lower courts, that's called vertical precedent. Well, no, one year isn't enough <laughs> to fully absorb what's going on here. To get the old out of our system and to get the new into our system. So there's a lot to be done to learn what Dobbs means. We have to study it. That's why we give you this SupremeCourtVictory.com as a resource. We've got to understand it. Only then will we be able to build on it. Okay, so that's my uh, first of five points that I want to make to you. The second point... Dobbs did not simply return the issue to the states. This, I was warning about this, and so were many other pro-life leaders during the months that the Dobbs decision was percolating at the Supreme Court from the time. The, the court announced that it was taking the case in May of 2021. So it was a full year plus that this was um, actively being debated uh, and examined at the court. The oral arguments, as you might remember, took place in December, December 1st of 2021. Um, prior to that, all the friend of the court briefs were being submitted. We submitted one. After that, uh, then, you know, the justices were deliberating. And then we had the leak in May uh, of 2022. And then the final decision that came out at the end of June was practically identical to what the leaked version was. But when you study it all, what we warned about came true. Because in those months, in that solid year, between the time that the court announced it was taking the case and brought down the final decision, people kept talking about, oh, well, the court is going to return the issue to the states. That's not an adequate way to explain what happened. And I was on conference calls with members of Congress and other leaders warning about this and saying, look, let's not, that, that it's an imperfect, it's a half truth. It's an imperfect way of saying it. Let's not talk this way. Let's be more precise. And the more precise way of saying it is exactly what the holding of the decision of Dobbs says. It returned the issue, because the court, they said, returns the issue of abortion policy to the people and their elected representatives. Now, what does that mean? At every level of government. Congress still has a role and a duty to protect the unborn. In fact, one of the key briefs of the Dobbs case was precisely from members of Congress saying, hey, let us do our jobs. That is to legislate. Congress still has a role on this. The states, of course they do. Now, the return to the states, the truth in that is that under Roe and Casey, the states would act to protect the unborn and the courts would strike down the laws very easily without much thinking because, well, after all, Roe and Casey are in place. Okay, so it, it, it snuffled, it, 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 of course, squelched a lot of the activity of the states where people wanted to protect the unborn. So it frees up the states, of course, to do a lot more. But by the very same token, it frees up the federal Congress to do the very same thing, to protect the unborn. So the, 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 another way I explain this is, we're going to have to give ourselves a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of room here. 
to take away. Let me erase this first one here. Well, what, what, one of the way, well, let me just give myself more room here. One of the ways to understand this is to say instead of, in, instead of thinking about it as a vertical change, okay, from the federal level to the state level, instead of thinking about what Dobbs did in that sense, think about it in a horizontal way. It, 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 it shifted it from the jurisdiction of the courts to the legislatures, or better yet, the people and their elected representatives. That was the shift. Okay, we should have the arrow is going that way. Not that the courts don't have any jurisdiction over the abortion issue, but that they no longer are going to stifle the will of the people and their elected representatives when it comes to protecting the unborn. That was the shift. Legislatures, now, Congress, the states, but even local government were very involved in supporting and helping uh, the sanctuary cities for the unborn movement. These were got city councils voting to uh, restrict and prohibit abortion in their jurisdiction. So it's the people and their elected representatives at every level of government. Okay, so point number one is that we have to more fully understand and absorb what the Dobbs decision says. Point number two, it did not simply return the matter to the states. It returned it to the people and their elected representatives. Now, here's point number three of the five things that I want you to think about as, and talk about as we get to the first anniversary of Dobbs. And point number three is that the pro-abortion forces continue now to reinvent the lie of Roe v. Wade. And what is that lie? That there is such a thing as a constitutional right to abortion. How do they continue to reinvent the lie? Well, first of all, we call it a lie because that was exactly one of the key things that Dobbs said. Dobbs said very clearly at no point in American history, not in a federal law, not in a state law, not in a federal court, not in a state court, not in an academic scholarly article, not in legal tradition, nowhere in American history was a constitutional right to abortion ever asserted until the time that Roe v. Wade came along. Never. You'll search the historical landscape it's not there. And, and the reason this is important, not to go too deep into constitutional uh, law, but there are, I'm sure, out there some of you who are constitutional attorneys, you know this very well, or law students listening. If a right is not explicitly stated in the Constitution, then one of the places you look to see whether indeed it is a constitutional right is history. In the history, does the legal tradition of America, does the history of American law, jurisprudence, court decisions, etc., assert that right? Well, when it comes to abortion, not only is it not in the text of the Constitution, it's nowhere in the history, nowhere. Now, how are the pro-abortion forces continuing to reinvent the lie that there's a constitutional right to abortion when the Supreme Court said it is nowhere in the federal Constitution? They're putting it in the state constitutions. Now, some of them were doing this before Dobbs, but now we see a full-blown attempt. This past year, the pro-abortion people have been very busy, not only passing extreme laws that don't codify Roe. Don't, don't get that, that. Don't let them use that for it. Oh, we're codifying Roe versus Wade. No, 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 they're doing no such thing. Because you look at Roe versus Wade and it said, well, the state can prohibit abortion in the later, la later months, of, the last months of pregnancy, the third trimester. And it's like when the Democrats say they want to codify Roe, I said, okay, so in other words, you're going to allow the states to, to prohibit some abortions. And, oh, no, 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 no. Well, then you're not codifying Roe, you're going way beyond it. So, yes, they've passed some extreme laws allowing abortion to birth, 
and even weakening the protections of babies after birth. But the way that the other side is reinventing the lie is to say, well, we want to have abortion put into the constitutions of these states. And so there were votes, for example, in California, in Michigan. Right now the battleground is Ohio. They want to put this year a constitutional change there in Ohio recognizing a, a right to abortion. And we've got to come across against this very, very strongly using the very same arguments that Dobbs did. Because if Dobbs said that never anywhere in American history was a constitutional right to abortion asserted, that's not just true to say for America, it's true to say for Ohio. And it's true to say for California. Never in Michigan history was there an assertion of a right to abortion. So where are you coming up with this all of a sudden? So, but they're trying, now why are they trying to reinvent that lie? Because they can't defend abortion on its merits. You see the problem that Dobbs causes for the other side? For 50 years, they were hiding behind the robes of the justices. They were hiding behind the court's assertion or fake dogma, if you will, that there was a constitutional right to abortion. And who wants to argue against the constitutional right? Who wants to oppose or deprive people of a fundamental right? So therefore, they didn't have to argue it on its merits. They didn't have to make the case, convince the voters, or convince their elected lawmakers that abortion is a good thing. They held, it was handed to them on a silver platter from the court that it's a constitutional right. Oh, yeah, end of discussion. That's one of the reasons why the lower court in the, in the whole Dobbs case, which started in Mississippi when they passed a, a law to protect uh, 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 these babies in the womb up to 15 weeks, the lower court said, we don't even want to hear the reasons why about the pain of the baby or harm to women. We don't even want to hear the reasons why because it's a constitutional right. It shuts down, it, asserting that shuts down discussion and relieves the other side, again, of having to make the case on its merits. But now that's gone. So it's like they feel like they're naked. They think, oh, blah, blah, how do I defend abortion? Let me go reinvent the constitutional right so I can hide behind the state court like I used to hide behind the Supreme Court. Okay, got it? So that's point number three. Now, point number four for us to keep in mind as we prepare to observe this um, anniversary of Roe versus Wade. Brothers and sisters, we have to help our politicians not to run away from this issue. Because some are doing exactly that. Why do we have to help them not to run away from this issue? Why should we be telling them, do not be afraid of this issue? Because to express your pro-life conviction that these living children in the womb should be protected is not extreme. In fact, it corresponds to a fundamental position of the American people who do not like abortion, who certainly do not want unrestricted abortion. Yes, they're conflicted about abortion, especially in the earliest stages and especially in certain hard cases. But the fundamental point is that if you're clear, if you're compassionate, and if you make the argument that this is a child and that life should be protected and that we want equality of protection, no matter how small or young or vulnerable a person might be. In fact, you can make the argument, the more vulnerable a person is, the more protection they need, not less. It's going to be a winning issue, especially when you contrast it with the extremism of the Democrats. They want unrestricted abortion. So the two things we have to say to the politicians is, is A, show them that you are the people of compassion. The pro-life position is the compassionate position it's not extreme to want to protect children. And number two, 
Show them that you're the compassionate ones. And number two, point out the extremism of the Democrat position. You don't have to make it a matter of interpretation or opinion. They already have their bill that they voted on in the last Congress in the House, the Women's Health Protection Act, that would make nationwide abortion on demand without restrictions. That's the extreme position because the American people have never bought into that idea. Abortion on a healthy baby carried by a healthy mother, a baby who can survive outside the womb? No. The American people have never bought into that. And polling continues to affirm that over and over. So we have to help politicians not to run away from this issue. You know, politicians, even some who are pro-life, yeah, they're iffy, they're shaky. You know, this Congress, after Dobbs, Dobbs came down, the midterm elections were held, the new Congress convened right off the bat. They, they passed two pro-life bills. Now, there's a third one they wanted to deal with. It's the no taxpayer funding for abortion. Uh, but they still haven't brought that to a vote because some uh, are, are iffy at this. And some, when they, when they first uh, had these votes in January on, um, well, there was a resolution supporting the pregnancy centers, and then there was a, a vote on a bill they've been trying to vote, the Republicans have been trying to vote on for a long time, to strengthen protections for babies born alive after a failed abortion. Some of the members of the new Congress started saying, well, why do we have to be dealing with this abortion issue again? I mean, hey, guys, wrong question. Wrong question. We just had Dobbs, which opened the door for you in the Congress to do your job and protect these children. So don't say, why are we dealing with this issue? We're dealing with this issue because for 50 years it's been dealt with in the wrong way. And now it's time to start dealing with it in the right way. Dobbs didn't do our work for us to bring about protection for these babies. They made it way easier for us to protect these babies. And that leads us into our fifth and final point here that I want to dwell on tonight. We have to continue celebrating because there's a lot to celebrate here. I want the anniversary of Dobbs to be a celebration. Continue celebrating. And double down on the work that still has to be done. We celebrate for all the reasons I already explained and that we explain in great detail at SupremeCourtVictory.com. We celebrate because tens of thousands of lives have been saved. When, as soon as Dobbs came down, at the earliest opportunity, about a dozen states began protecting the unborn. A few more came along after that. Protecting the unborn essentially throughout their lives, throughout the, the, the pregnancy. And then another five or so states came along and introduced protections, like, for example, from the time a heartbeat could be detected. Uh, it's fairly early. So, so we, we have... We have tens of thousands of lives that have been saved and are being saved day by day now thanks to the Dobbs decision. Not that the Dobbs decision imposed that protection, but again, it allowed the people and their elected representatives to bring that protection about. And many of these states, they were, they were, they were at the starting gate already. They were ready. They had done the work already. They had trigger, trigger laws. Some of them created new laws at the, at the, once that door was open. And it was great to see. And for five decades, we were saying, we were looking and hoping and waiting at the edge of our seats. What's going to be the first abortion-free state? Now we have over a dozen of them. So continue celebrating and double down on the work to be done. We have got a lot to do to resist and oppose what the pro-abortion people are trying to do. Because again, court opened the door both ways. They're using the people and their elected representatives to get more abortion happening. We have a divided nation. But Dobbs opens the door for us to work in every state to bring about that protection. Because no longer, 
whether it's in a courtroom, a legislative hall, or in private conversation, can someone simply say, oh, well, you've got to allow abortion because it's a constitutional right. That argument is over on the federal level. Can't just say that. You, gotta, you think abortion's okay? Make your case. You think abortion's wrong? We have made our case. And we continue to make it, but the evidence is all on our side. The arguments are all with life. So on the day of June 24th, I'm going to be um, in Washington, D.C. I'll actually be speaking at the Faith and Freedom Conference, a national conference of conservative leaders and activists. And I'll be giving a talk, of course, on the very thing I'm talking with you about here uh, in Washington, D.C. I'll be giving a major uh, talk that day. Uh, and then after giving that talk in the morning, I will be going over to a midday uh, prayer rally service outside the Capitol. You'll see details. We'll be putting up more details on SupremeCourtVictory.com. If you're going to be in the D.C. area, you can join me for that. But even more importantly, we're going to have a special period of prayer over these next few weeks leading up to the decision. All of this, again, at SupremeCourtVictory.com. We're going to have a special uh, period of prayer that we want to ask you to be involved in and promote and bring to you the attention of your pastors and prayer groups and do it in your families and individually. And a, and a special series of educational broadcasts, this one actually launching and starting this uh, effort off over these next few weeks to delve once again into the decision itself. Like I said before, read it, reread it. And, uh, and, 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 and educate others about it as well. Praise God for this tremendous victory over Roe v. Wade. You know, I go around speaking all the time, and it's so great because wherever I go and, and, and whatever audience it is, and, you know, you just say the words, Roe v. Wade has been reversed, and it is a guaranteed thunderous applause so should it be every moment in our hearts. So those of us that have worked and continue to work so hard to protect the very youngest of our brothers and sisters. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this upcoming anniversary. May it be a sign to us both of the resilience of our form of government that we can correct errors like this in a peaceful way. But Lord, even more so a sign of your fidelity to your people your power to answer prayer, your faithfulness to your own promises, that you would be the God of deliverance and of life. May we savor this victory every day. May we truly celebrate it. And may we build on this victory. And we pray now as Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Thanks, friends. Connect with me on social media. I am at FR Frank Pavone on all the platforms. At FR Frank Pavone. Let's stay connected. Let's stay strong in this cause. And let's stay connected on these broadcasts. Talk to you soon. God bless.